Good evening, I'm Lionel White, Director of Facilities Planning with Arlington Public Schools. Uh, tonight, I'll be presenting APS enrollment projections. And uh, my colleague, Mr. John Chadwick, he will give a presentation on APS actions uh, to address increasing enrollment. But, so I'll start off first. Uh, of course, you've seen this slide that shows the difference between the county's forecast and the school enrollment projections. So I don't need to really go over that again. Uh, in terms of tonight's presentation, I'll talk about increasing enrollment over time and today. I'll talk about our enrollment projection methodology. Then I'll get into current projections and anticipated enrollment. And then I'll finish with uh, monitoring enrollment trends. All right, increasing enrollment. Uh, I don't even need to talk about this. You all know what a cohort is by now. But in terms of the way I use the term cohort, cohort refers to a group of students who are in the same grade. Okay. Here's our first uh, graph that shows historic enrollment from 1961 to 2014. And it's been uh, the lines you see there in the graph uh, break it up in 10-year increments or decades. So you'll notice that in the 60s, APS had enrollment well above 25,000 students. Uh, if you look at the period of the 70s, that second bar there, the second area, uh, we see that enrollment declined dramatically. It went from about 24,000, a little bit below 15,000. So a decrease of about 10,000 students over a decade. That's huge. Uh, if we look at the 80s, we see it kind of flatten out. Uh, projection, the enrollment hovering around 15,000 students. Then we look at the 90s, we see a gradual increase, kind of gradually ramping up, sloping upward. Uh, followed by 2000, a little bit of a flat, uh, a dip around 2007, Great Recession time, and then explosion. Uh, e extremely uh, rapid growth. And you can tell by kind of the slope of that line. Uh, when I think of a slope of the line, I look at it and think of an amusement ride. You know, so, you know, the 80s, that wouldn't have been a very fun amusement park ride, right? But if you look at 2007 and beyond, you just, it's going up, it's ratcheting up, and you know, you know, we're going to have some fun. All right. Okay, here's our total enrollment over the past decade. And we see that in 2004, we had a little over, we nearly 19,000 students. Uh, as of September 30th, uh, the term we use for that is our official count. Each year on September 30th, the school system pulls a snapshot of how many students are in enrollment, and we use that number year-round pretty much in all, of the, in all of our materials. So uh, this year, 2014, our official count was 24,529. We're talking a growth of almost 5,800 students uh, over the past decade. That's pretty large growth. Uh, here's the same chart. This time it's broken up by school level. So you see at the bottom of the chart, pre-K is in the yellow. Uh, then we have kindergarten through fifth grade in the gray. And again, thinking of that amusement ride, look at that slope going up. And the, the more fun, the deeper the slope. Uh, the orange uh, is middle school. And lastly, uh, high school is in the blue. All right. Here's our pre-K enrollment over the past decade. It started off with 783 in 2004. This year, we're up to 1108. Uh, the demand for pre-K is very strong in Arlington. So uh, in terms of the enrollment growth of the pre-K, uh, it's, really, it's based on really the ability for the state to provide matching funds for the VPI program. Uh, we have a Huge demand for it, but just not enough slots, quite honestly, for demand. Okay, in terms of our pre-K uh, programs that are available, there's the Virginia Preschool Initiative, aka VPI, and that's a program where the state uh, provides a 50-50 match of funds for students that participate in that program. Then we also have a Montessori pre-K program where parents pay a yearly tuition based on their annual income. 
And then lastly, there's special ed pre-K, and these are, that's for students that are identified with special needs, and believe it or not, special ed pre-K can start as early as the age of two years old, depends on how early they're identified. And of course, pre-K is important because our research shows that it's uh, reducing the achievement gap uh, for students that are economically disadvantaged as well as students and or students that are limited English proficient. Now I'll move on to K-5 growth. So LM, uh, kindergarten through fifth grade enrollment growth over the past decade, we're talking 33,580 more students since 2004. And again, wonderful slope on that line. Here we are with middle school enrollment over the past decade, 1,065 more middle school students. And just to give you some kind of bearing, uh, Williamsburg Middle School has an enrollment or a capacity of 900, 997 seats. So to give you some perspective, over the past decade, we've grown the equivalent of a single middle school, our largest middle school. Uh, here we are with high school, uh, started off 5,342 this year, uh, we're up to 6,157, a growth of 815 more high school students. Our average high school uh, is about 1,900 or so seats, so this is about 45% or so of a high school in terms of growth. All right, now I'm gonna switch a little bit and jump in back into kindergarten uh, enrollment trends. Over the past decade, we've grown, and this is a big number, 568 more kindergarten students today than there were 10 years ago. Um, this year, um, our kindergarten cohort was 2,196 students. Next year, we're anticipating more. Next year, we're anticipating our highest. This year was our highest on record. Next year will be the highest on record, just to give you some indication. Uh, here we have a bar chart that shows our total enrollment by grade. And this is the co each cohort for this school year. So we see our pre-K cohort. We see our kindergarten cohort at 2,196 students. Interestingly enough, I put on here the 12th grade cohort because I wanted you to see uh, the senior, this year's senior class that's leaving is 1,463 students. Next year's kindergarten cohort is anticipated to be above 2,200. So, you know, demographers use this term natural increase, and that's pretty much, you, you would subtract, you, Take 2,200, subtract 1,463, and it says there's a natural increase of 800 more students. Uh, and that's a big number. Uh, and if another interesting thing to note, if you look at kindergarten first and second, um, those cohorts are all relatively large. If you look at 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, look at the, look at the differences. So in terms of looking at natural increase over time, you see what's coming. Okay. Here we have a chart of uh, 2014 enrollment by grade, and now we're comparing it to 2010. So the, the, the uh, purple line there shows uh, enrollment in 2010, and the top of the gray there shows you where we are today. To give you some frame of reference to how much we've grown since 2010, is where we are since 2007. There's 2004, 10 years ago. So we've done a lot of growing. And we're not finished yet. And for those of you that like brain teasers, there's 2004, 2007, and 2010, how about that? Right. And uh, interesting to note, looking at this, we see at uh, second grade, uh, pretty large gaps. But notice 10th 
uh, the high school grades, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, the, the, the enrollment numbers are fairly tight. But at the elementary level, you see the bigger gaps, right? which, of course, suggests that growth. OK, so some key takeaways that are that APS, we're getting back to where we used to be in the 60s. Uh, for some of us that are relatively new to Arlington, we may have thought this is a new phenomenon. No, Arlington is getting back to where it was before. We've had rising enrollment since 2005. And then we have what I call high growth enrollment since 2008. And I just want to give you some perspective on that. High growth, most school systems, if they grow at 2% a year, that's considered high. To give you some perspective, last year we grew over 5%. So that is really, really, really high growth. And I don't think that's sustainable. I just want to put that out there. But just to let you know where our growth is, the year prior to that, we grew well over 3%. So we're much higher than most uh, areas in the country. All right, now talk about our enrollment projection methodology. Uh, we use the grade progression ratio method, and that's used by most school systems across the country. Uh, it's based on uh, three-year averaging of uh, student enrollment trends. Uh, of course, no one enrollment projection methodology is universal and works for everybody. Every community is different. They have different drivers, different economic conditions that, de that determine what model works best for them. Uh, we use, again, this grade progression ratio, but we kind of have added some extra uh, t uh, data to it to, to make it uh, better. And I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. All right, so the grade progression ratio, it projects future uh, population uh, by advancing students from one grade to the next grade and looking at the percent change. And it takes that percent, a, a three-year average of that percent change to then extrapolate what enrollment will be in the future. Uh, the source of this data is our official count, which happens on September 30th each year. The uh, reliability of our model, it's really good for the first five years. Uh, however, it becomes a little less accurate years six through 10, particularly at the elementary level. Uh, we use the fall projections for the superintendent's proposed budget. The spring projections, which will be released very soon, uh, they inform the school board's adopted budget. Uh, and there's, uh, in our process, we have what we call planning factors. And these are formulas uh, that provide uh, equity and consistency for personnel, equipment, and supplies. Um, so depending on your projection and this planning factor, each school will be allocated a certain amount of funds and resources uh, to meet the needs of students. And lastly, uh, short-term pro uh, enrollment projections help us with facility planning decisions, things like boundary refinements. Do we need to make a minor boundary tweak this year to, b to balance enrollment between two schools? Should we look at relocating programs or, and or should we use relocatable classrooms? Not the T word. Trailers, we don't like that word, right? All right. Long-term uh, uses of the projections, uh, they feed into our AFSAP, uh, which helps us, which is the Arlington Facility Student Accommodation Plan, and that helps us identify current and future seat needs for students. Then there, of course, is the 10-year CIP, or the Capital Improvement Plan, and that gives us the capital strategies. Capital strategies, pretty much, how do we build our way more seats? How do we build more seats, more structure? Conversely, it also helps us with capacity development planning, which is the exact opposite of capital planning. Uh, these are non-capital strategies. So instead of building it, how about we use what we have more efficiently to increase capacity? 
Okay, now I'm going to get into the inputs to the model. So, of course, there's a September 30 official count. Then we use this cohort progression ratio. We use resident live births. It's important, that word resident, because we only care about Arlington resident live births. If you're not a resident of Arlington, we don't really want you in our model uh, because it has, you'll inflate our numbers. And, and, you know, Arlington serves Arlington residents, so it's resident live births. Uh, then, of course, projected housing growth. And Andrew and the team, have, we work very closely with them on this piece of information for our model. And I'm thankful for the great job that they do in having this information available in a GIS format, and we share it and talk and have great conversation. Uh, lastly is what we call our student generation factors. Uh, that's the last piece of the model. And I'll talk about that shortly. All right, we already talked about September 30th enrollment. We figure out how many students there are at each grade. Uh, I'm going to move on here to the cohort progression ratio calculation. For all you math nerds out there, including myself, you like to see how it's calculated. So I had to put this slide for you, just for you. So we see we have our September 30th membership. And this is an example for an elementary school students advancing from second grade to the third grade. So in 2011, there are 99 second graders. One year later, 2012, 98 second graders. This one year average is 0.989. Most normal people say, okay, that's 99%. There was a loss of one student, it's about 1% loss of that cohort, right? So then if we were to take the three year average from 2011 through 2014, we see that the three-year average is 0.996. Some people would round that to one. Some people say, give me the three digits. But the key question is, I'm going to see who's done their homework. If there are 93 second graders in 2014 and the cohort progression ratio says is 0.99, how many third graders will we have in 2015? All right, you got it. Mission accomplished. All right, so here is our cohort progression ratio for all of our cohorts, right? This, I, I love this. This is a great piece of information right here. Look at kindergarten to one. Cohort progression ratio is 1.0. That means the same kids pretty much pass on. One to two, 0.993. You can round that up to a 1% loss in cohort. So if there were 100 kids, how many are coming back next year? 99. We're not losing a lot. Look at second to third, point, uh, 0.987, 2% loss. And really, if you round that up, 1% loss. Third to fourth, 0 0.99. Fourth to fifth, 0.99. The thing that really jumps off the chart, and I apologize because I've contributed to this number, let's look at the 8th to 9th. 1.09. That says there's a 9% increase as students transition from the 8th grade to the 9th grade. And I said I contributed. My daughter, we just became Arlington residents a week ago. I enrolled her into Gunston Middle School. She's an eighth grader. I, I do my part. I do my part. <laughs> so I have adjusted the projections by one. But, you know, that's a really big number there. And also, you know, look at nine to 10, 3% growth. You know, so we're, we're essentially, we're growing in the ninth and the 10th grade, and we're relatively flat in the other grades. We're not losing a bunch of people, at least over this past three year period. Okay, that's very important to know. All right. So then we get back to resident live births. This is another part of our model. And again, these are uh, children, most kids that register for pre-K or for kindergarten are five years old. And what we do is we compare the number of kids born five years prior to the current year and then compute this what we call birth to kindergarten ratio. 
And the source of this information is the, the Virginia Department of Health. We get their live birth data information that's produced by county. And of course, we have our kindergarten cohort information from our September 30 report. All right, so here are Arlington's resident live births since 2004. We see in 20, 2004, 2,800 live births. Then I'll jump to 2009, 2,900 births. The reason why 2009 was highlighted is because this year, this is our kindergarten cohort. Uh, they, there were 2,900 of them born in Arlington, and uh, about 2,197, we can check the numbers, showed up the first day of school. Another interesting thing to note, from 2010 through 2013, look at that number, over 3,000. Remember that conversation we just had about these cohorts and cohort progression ratios? Okay, thank you. But before we get there, let's talk about this kindergarten capture rate, which is huge. In 2000, our kindergarten capture rate was about 55%. Nine years later, our kindergarten capture rate is 75%. That's a whopping 20 percentage point increase in the number of kids that are born here and are staying here. And uh, you know, that's a really strong piece of information. Of course, Arlington is a very desirable place to live for families, and that's why people are staying here. You know, I've heard talk of, oh, yeah, people going back to the suburbs. Our data doesn't necessarily support that right now. Okay. All right, so then we get to projected housing growth. And, of course, we use projecting housing growth to bolster the accuracy of our long-term projection because Andrew and the team they have all this wonderful data. You know, they, it's, it's perfect. They tell me, here's the address, and uh, here's how many units we're anticipating. And then I take my student generation factor and do this multiplication and figure out, oh, okay, well, this is how many students we can expect. Essentially, that's what we do in our process. All right. The student generation factor, again, is a multiplier. And it's, it's a multiplier, and it's based on the type of housing unit you reside in. Are you single family? Are you townhouse? Are you condo? Are you duplex? Are you garden apartment? Are you elevator? And uh, here are student generation factors by housing type. This is last year's information. Uh, we have at the top there, the housing type is single family detached. It's still, uh, percentage wise, of course, is it's number one, 55% of our housing stock uh, that produces students, it's 55% it's come from single family detached homes. The student generation factor, that 0.42, it's, again, it's a multiplier. One way to think of it is, if there were 100 housing units, you can expect 42 students from those housing units. That's how you read this. So if single family detached is the highest, then we get down to the lowest right now, which is condo elevator. 0 0.03. So if there were 100 units built, now it depends. I know my people here in the county are saying, well, it depends. Is it affordable or not, or market rate? Well, right now, based on our data countywide, it would give us, 100 units would give us three students. Now, this is a piece of information we're monitoring very closely each year. We need to know if that number is increasing, right? Because then we'll, if, that, if those, if, if the student, uh, if there's a change in our student generation factor at condo, uh, either elevator or garden or any of these, you know, that's something we have to stay on top of in order to, do, to give accurate projections and forecast, or actual, accurate projections. These guys do forecasting. All right, so here we have our percent students by housing type. It hasn't really changed that much over time. 2004, 51%. Uh, single family detached uh, students come from single family detached homes. Last year, about 55%. All right. And here's a summary of our enrollment projection inputs. You have that in your, your documents. 
All right, so the key takeaways are projections, of course, different than forecasts. And at APS, we actually use real student, we use live births and real student data to prepare what we do. We use three years of historic uh, student trends to anticipate future enrollment change. Single family detached homes have the highest student generation factor, while condo elevator units have the lowest student generation factor. And the live birth data suggests large kindergarten cohorts, 2,200 plus, entering APS over the next four years. Now let's get to the projections and anticipated enrollment. Again, we're going to get back on that roller coaster. Uh, next year, 2015, you know, you look at that slope of that line between 2015 and 2024, it's going, it's going up. We're anticipating 7,800 students between now and 2024. Now let's break it out. Here's elementary enrollment projections. And see this, it starts off, you know, 13,400 or so, and it's going up about a little over 15,800, almost 15,900. So over the first five years or in the short term, we're anticipating 1,500 more elementary students. Our average size elementary school now in Arlington is about 530 seats. 1,500 more elementary students by 2019. You know, our new max, uh, preferred max class uh, school size, 725 seats. That's 1,500 more students in the next five years. We're going to need at least, we, you know, the number suggests two schools, right? Here's middle school. Over the next five years, approximately 1,400 more middle school students. That's, to, you know, our Williamsburg Middle School, currently largest. 997 seats. I believe the new preferred max middle school is about 1,300 seats. We need a little more than one middle school. Here we are with high school. Over the next five years, 1,800 more high school students. Average high school around 1,900 or so now. The new max might take it up to 20, about 2,200. We're saying we Probably going to need another high school. Notice I'm pointing out the first five years. Because I could get into the last five years, but I did say it gets a little more fuzzy. So I want to stick with something that I feel is fairly solid. So that's why I'm emphasizing the first five. just want to point that out to you. All right. Uh, Here's a chart that shows, and I got to be very careful when I say this, this is our K through 12 countywide projections. This is one year, uh, you know, from this year to the next year. We're really good with our K through 12 one year projections. The preferred range is about 2%. So uh, ideally, we could be 100% correct. You know, next year there's going to be 25 I'm making up a number. Next year, it's supposed to be it's going to be 26,000 students. That's what, that's what happens in reality. And I should say, it's going to be 26,000 students and hit it dead on. That would be 100%. But that's not real, right? Because we know of all these factors going on. So 2% error is pretty reasonably good. So as long as we're in that 98 to 102, we're in a safe zone. For me, I feel comfortable and say I can defend that. That's respectable. So over the past decade, our average, pretty much nine of the ten years, we we're in the safe zone. We had one year, eh, barely out. But our projections are very accurate. Key takeaways, our projections are pretty accurate. They average 100.8%, which is saying we're usually a tad bit over but we're about 1% off, so about 99% accurate over the past decade. And I've already showed you the kind of the low and the high on that chart. All right. In terms of enrollment trends, of course, we're going to continue uh, collaborating with county staff uh, related to population and housing trends. 
Uh, we're going to pursue collecting more information from families when they register, like where are you coming from, and all these other questions. We, we're going to get that information. As well as periodically, after your child's in school, we need to follow up with you more and say, hey, you got a, another kid on the way, another student we can expect, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, also, we want to, I'm collaborating with other school uh, planners here in the greater metro area, and we all kind of get together and we swap stories and, hey, this is what's happening in my area. And, you know, the goal is to network and try to improve our methodology by looking at other people's problems. Uh, and lastly, uh, we're going to continue to use GIS mapping technology and hopefully uh, our ability to map out things like housing trends and different types of patterns that will help improve our long-range forecasting efforts. All right, now I'm going to pass it on to Mr. John Chadwick, who is going to talk to you about APS actions to address increasing enrollment. Dr. Chad. Thank you, Lionel. You're a hard act to follow. Um, I'm John Chadwick. I'm Assistant Superintendent for Facilities and Operations. I'm going to show you one more chart, and then that's the last one I'm going to show this evening. It's hard to follow all of these charts, so we're going to look at maps. You know, um, the one thing that distinguishes Arlington Public Schools needs uh, and what controls us, that distinguishes us from the county, is that we are legally obliged to take every child that shows up at our doors. Um, we have no choice, we're in big trouble if we don't, and we obviously always have taken them. Um, we've been dealing with growth, you can see from these charts, for the last, really since about 1990, it's been going up, there's a little bit of a dip in the unis. Um, and I think, but I think a lot of the people probably in this room and in the community haven't been following it that long, I certainly wasn't here when that started, and aren't really aware of what we've been doing. The school board has continuously monitored this situation since it started growing. I'm not going to say anything about the schools we gave back in the uh, 70s and 80s. Um, actually, some of them we would love to have back again. Some of them are really small and really wouldn't help us very much. So we're going to look at the, at the last 20 years and take a look at what the school board actually did. Um, there's a key here. The purple flags are new construction. The teal colored flags are reopening with a renovation. The green are renovations and additions. The orange are boundary adjustments. And then the red is program moves or other classes and programs. So in starting in 1994, we completed an addition and renovation at Taylor. I will say that was a geothermal project. We've just replaced some of that, but this geothermal our system is essentially working, and it's our best performing school in the county. Um, in 1995, we reopened Gunston, which had closed in 1978, and Claremont, which had closed uh, around the same time. I believe the Gunston was used by the county, and Claremont was a police training facility. That, so that reopened as an elementary school in 95. In 1998, the school board completed renovations and additions at Key and Tuckahoe Elementary Schools. In 2000, there was a renovation and addition completed at Barrett Elementary School. 2001, renovations at Drew and Oak Ridge, and most of these renovations added capacity. And we reopened Hoffman Boston with a renovation. It had been closed as well. In 2002, Carlin Springs School was constructed and completed uh, next to Kenmore. Um, Glen Carlin was reopened after a renovation as Campbell. And Claremont was reopened again as the second countywide Spanish immersion program. We also in that year completed renovations and additions at Jamestown and Williamsburg. You see the flags are really growing around the county. In 2003, we completed the new Kenmore and then demolished the old one. And we completed a renovation and addition at Swanson Middle School. In 2004, Arlington Traditional School received a renovation and expansion 
as did Nottingham. In 2005, there was a renovation and addition at Glebe completed, and there was a policy change to uh, create a neighborhood and cluster school at Barrett. In 2005, there was a policy change. We moved the CIP to 10 years to align with what the county does, and as you've seen, those are the numbers we produce. In 2009, new construction was completed at Washington Lee. That was a complete uh, reconstruction uh, of an occupied building in multiple phases. That school was designed initially for 1,600 students using the schedule that was planned initially, which was a utilization fact of using, on average, every classroom five out of seven periods during the day. When we opened that school, or shortly after it was opened, the school board approved um, a planning model or a scheduling model of using each space six out of seven periods. We recently completed a study last year uh, on Washington Lee and how it was actually being used. And we found that that six sevenths wasn't happening. The school board subsequently approved a $5 million project in the 2015 CIP to increase capacity to that school without actually enlarging it. Um, and that is really reorganizing it so that there are professional learning labs for, for teachers uh, and classes can be used six out of seven periods a day. And the common spaces are addressed because obviously there are going to be more students. And that will bring up the capacity of that school by at least 300 more students. So we've actually designed a school that was for 1,600 students. And by the beginning of the, uh, of the school year uh, next September, not this year, but the following year, we'll be able to accommodate 2,200 students. We're in the process of working through the same process at uh, Yorktown and Wakefield, and we fully expect to be able to get with similar amount of effort, similar amount of money, hopefully less, another 300 students at each of those schools. And that's without doing any additions. It's some internal renovations. Uh, some of it's to do with furniture, and a lot of it is to allow teachers to become more collaborative and give them a real place where they can work and want to work on planning. So <clears throat> getting back to what the school board did in 2009, the school board also implemented and approved a progressive planning model, which came out of a study that was done during the course of 2009. <coughs> and that progressive planning model says, first of all, use what you have more intensively. So we converted some computer labs, some other rooms to classrooms, and looked for ways to, make, to be able to use those, those buildings more effectively. The second stage was to look at um, Increasing class size, and that, I believe, has happened once, if not twice, since then. Uh, other, th other models are to add relocatable classrooms, and then after you've gone through all of those, then you make additions, renovations, and new schools. Uh, and in fact, we've been following that, and we constantly find that, yes, we can still get more students in existing schools without necessarily overcrowding them or in any way diminishing the learning that goes on in the schools. So now we're at 2013. I think this is wrong. Jefferson was finished earlier than that. But there were renovations and additions to Jefferson. And then, again, the complete reconstruction, except for two small pieces of Yorktown High School, um, which, uh, when it opened, had a capacity of about 1,900 students. And as I said, we'll go to 2,200. 2013, we completed Wakefield, uh, same issue there. Uh, that was complete, the, the fields of Wakefield were completed in 14. So in 2014, we opened the renovation and addition to Ashlawn. And as many of you know, we have the new Discovery Elementary School under construction, which is scheduled to open in September of this year. Uh, we have the McKinley Renovation and Addition Project, which will add about 240 students to the McKinley campus. Um, that was out to bid and is scheduled to be completed by September of 2017. Uh, we have just uh, about to approve, uh, the school board is just about to approve concept design for the Abingdon Renovation Addition. That will add 189 seats 
um, but also um, do a major renovation of the school. And as you know, the debate continues uh, on as to how we provide the other seats. So I think what I have to say is that's a lot of flags, it's a lot of work, and it shows that the school board was as on top of what they could be doing as possible during that period to address the continuous growth. In um, other actions that we've done to Im increase capacity are several boundary change adjustments. We relocate a number of uh, programs that are countywide programs. We relocate them to spaces where there are in schools that are available, but we also relocate them to approve instruction. So we try to cluster them together so that the teachers and the students can support one another. We've added relocatables. We have about 124 today. Um, we're beginning to move them around. As we finish new seats, we can take them away and put them in other locations. And we've increased transportation options to allow some schools to be used more fully. We've, as and I've also mentioned, we've increased class sizes. So some takeaways from that. We have monitored, continually monitor current and, and future capacity. And as Lionel has shown you, crowding grows, goes through the schools at each school level as those cohorts progress. We have different solutions at different school levels, and the issue is finding the right combination of solutions. There isn't any one solution. There are many solutions to, to, to this issue. Future changes are going to require boundary adjustments. The only time that a school district doesn't have to look at boundary adjustments is when there's no growth. As long as there's growth, we're going to be looking at gap boundary adjustments because we, if we build schools, we have schools, we have to fill them, and we have to uh, distribute the students equally, equitably. If and when, which appears inevitable, we begin to decline in enrollment, then there will be boundary changes around that, as there were in the past. Um, and what we need is a collective shared vision between county government and schools around how we do that. And the process that you're going through here is very much contributing to a roadmap for that. We're working, as we've said, on options, short-term options, interim solutions, and then permanent solutions. And we really believe very strongly that what you're doing here will help us and is a very, very valuable initiative for the whole county. So the one thing I can say is to quote Frank Wilson, that change can be good, change can be bad, but all change is hard, and that's what we're going through. Thank you for your patience. I think I hand it over to you, Ginger.